Hello and welcome back to VMware Explore 2024, live from Las Vegas. It's a tongue twister, you know, so many years of calling it other things, but we're here at VMware Explore 2024, and I, I think one of the things that really has uh, transpired over the past, I, I would say this week, has been really the coming together of VMware and Broadcom in as one company, this is really the first one, and I think there's a lot of different people here. Uh, I'm joined by Serge Lucio. <laughs> did I get that yeah, right? Yeah, okay. I got it right. He's the Vice President and General Manager of Agile Operations Division for Broadcom. And I, I think one of the things, you know, we were kind of talking beforehand, and yeah. I, 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 having been on the product side a number of times in my career, uh, I actually used the, the product you have that, with Rally. So, and you guys had Thank an you. announcement with it uh, yes. this week as well, which I, I find very interesting. What was the announcement about? And yeah, so the, the announcement is that for the first time we're delivering Rally, which is our enterprise agile management solution at scale on premise. So historically for pretty much 25 years, Rally has been a multi-tenant SaaS product and for the first time, it's going to be available to be deployed on premise, on VCF infrastructure or other um, container-based infrastructure. Um, the, the main driver is really that what we've seen is, is really many of our customers, especially in Europe, really taking a different stance on data privacy. Um, and they really want to have these data to be in their data center or co-located uh, with their environment. And so we, we're addressing those needs uh, through, uh, through Rally Anywhere. Yeah, sovereignty is a big thing, especially like you said in Europe, and we've seen that. I, I think, help people understand the Agile Operations Division and how it kind of fits in, because I mean, I don't usually think Rally and then think VMware. So it's yeah. kind of like, you know, it That's was interesting. Point. I mean, there is Spring and Tanzu and things of that nature, and you know, I get that part where it kind of aligns with that, yeah. but. So, so if you look at the Agile Operation Division today, it really comprises kind of three product areas. And really our focus is really on the digital transformation that many of our large enterprise customers are having. And there are two sides we're really tackling. The first one, which is really where Clarity and Rally sit, is really about helping those organizations rethink their operating model. So we've been on this Agile journey for 20 years. The problem is that the business has to become Agile. We need to align business cycles, investment management. We need to move from project to product. We need to break down the silos between the business and IT. So that's the first product area. Very related to essentially what we're trying to do with Tenzu and serving the developers, but also aligning with the line of business side. So that's the first area. The two other areas in the portfolio really are aimed at the infrastructure transformation. Now, when we think about uh, infrastructure transformation, it's been multi-dimensional, right? We really are only focused on two areas. The first one is network. Many of these organizations have been moving to software-defined networks, have been leveraging the internet as core part of their network. The edge is becoming very critical. We need a new way to think about observing that network and dealing and managing with that network. In that area, we integrate with Velo Cloud, we integrate with NSX, we basically have solutions that provide you with end-to-end -end visibility across kind of a, the modern network. And finally, the third area is around automation. So when you think about automation and the traditional workload automation, we're well past that, right? We're looking at many of our customers trying to automate end-to-end -end processes, trying to do Gen AI in the private cloud, trying to build data pipelines, mm -hmm. and so there is this entire transformation around automation that we're tackling. Yeah, no, I, I think it, and again, to that, point when we were talking before, I think the, the whole value ops aspect of it, I, I get that and I, yep. I think that totally makes sense. I think when you started to go down into the pipeline and I, I instantly thought of, hey, private AI, you need to yep. be able to bring together different data from different places. How does that, how do those data pipelines and how does, how do you help with that data architecture? Yeah, so if you, if you look at um, data pipelines today, Many of our organizations have started to use Airflow or instances of Airflow like Google Cloud Composer and others, right? And one of the key challenges with these technologies is that they are fundamentally very developer-centric and they don't really take into account any of the enterprise-type features that you would expect. Uh, whether it is scheduling, SLA management, observability, you know, whenever DAGs, which embed DAGs into DAGs into DAGs fail, yeah. it becomes really a nightmare to actually understand what is happening. We have the ability not just to orchestrate DAGs, 
but also to provide end-to-end -end observability of, of these DAGs. We can automate traditional data. So we can go and pull data from a CRM, ERP system, or from traditional relational databases, do ETL type job processing, which we've been doing for the last 20, 25 years. We can restart jobs, we can provide SLA management. So in many ways, what we're doing is just bringing what traditionally has been, IT has been doing for 25 years into private AI into automating these data pipelines and also providing observability. We don't have to replace Airflow. We can layer our technology on top of Airflow to provide this kind of observability and SLA management. What, what is that called within the <laughs> Yeah, so, so the product I'm talking about <laughs> yeah. is called Atomic. Okay. It was actually listed as one of the advanced services this morning during the general session. Yeah. So Atomic is the name of the product. Uh, we actually, interestingly enough, released Atomic SaaS for the first time about three months ago. And so today you can actually use Atomic either as a SaaS solution if you want to do public AI, if you want to automate pipelines in the public cloud, or on-premise, deployed on VCF again, if you want to do private AI um, on-premise. Yeah, that, that to me makes total sense where you were talking about the sovereignty. And I, what we see is that a lot with AI, you know, you have this big, we have a uh, kind of our power law of uh, Gen AI, and what happens is you have a very large, you know, large language models that are at the beginning of this, but there's this long tail of small language models, which I, I believe was talked about at the general session today. Yeah, for sure. It would seem that this is one of those things because, again, if you're going into a CRM system, that's the holy grail, you know, data for most organizations. Are you seeing them? really embracing that that now that you have the private AI on the VMware side with Atomic and that bringing those two together, has that been? So I think we're a bit early in that journey, to be honest. Yeah. I think we, we're still trying to figure out how do we, do we actually get the developers to partner with the IT guys, right? And so we, you know, if you, if you look at Atomic traditionally, that's been a tool which was predominantly used by IT as a centralized control element to manage you know, security, to manage SLAs, to be able to have kind of a robust backend to manage the enterprise. A lot of these developers have been kind of running wild and, and doing tons of experiments. So we, we're really at these cusps now where we, we are engaged with many of these customers to try to figure out what is next, right? And how do we bring those two worlds together? So it, it's a bit early in that journey. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes total sense, but I, I, I think we'll kind of switch gears a little bit because I, I, we're, uh, we just had uh, Sanjay on from right. uh, the, on the yeah. edge and you know from a Velo cloud perspective, which again, the name's back. I'm seeing a lot of names coming <laughs> back. It's, it's I, I need to bring like a, a secret decoder ring with me again. Yeah, the, Rally like, was, was gone yeah. under CA Technologies and, and we brought it back. Yes. Yes, it, it's one of the things we, we go back to these brands of products that uh, our users love. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love that, and I heard another one that's coming back as well, which I won't go into, but it's like okay. very, very interesting. When, when you look at network observability and the product set that you have there, it would seem, again, Hawk and uh, Chris was talking about this earlier today on the stage, and uh, Sanjay talked about it, about how, again, the connecting across, not just with NSX, but you know, mm -hmm. the Velo Cloud. How do you see organizations looking at that because I, I think there's, there's there's a lot of people who are looking at it and you know I think Hawk even said this in a, another meeting that there's all these silos within IT that have to be broken down. Where where do you see this living within there in IT? Is it are there still net, network operation centers that are really focused on it or has it really moved into more of a platform engineering type of place? From a so you'd, you'd be surprised. You, yeah. I think what we see is more of a convergence between the SOC and the NOC, so the security side and yep. the network side. Reason being that a lot of the data at the end of the day is very similar. So there's definitely a bit more of a convergence on that side. The network engineering and the network operations side is still an area where we need to actually work a lot with these customers. Uh, they don't speak the same language. You often see, you know, we were talking with HC Healthcare earlier uh, who presented here, and they, they basically sh showcased how their network engineering team started to deploy uh, in-house, in-patient house, you know, technology for uh, connectivity back into their data center without alerting their network operations teams that 
the technology was actually in production. So, so I think we still have a bit of an issue in terms of, uh, again, the, the, the builders and the IT guys at the end of the day who are going to have to manage and operate those systems. Um, so we, from our point of view, are very focused on the network observability. And, um, and really at the end of the day, we're really trying to give visibility into parts of a network which traditionally have, ne have not been part of the enterprise. So traditionally, enterprises have been monitoring switches, routers, ports, you know, classic, you know, IT gear. Today, their network, in many cases, 80% of their network is actually the internet. It's provided by service providers. If they do not control, they do not control that network. And yet, they run critical workloads that span the data center and the cloud across these this interlinks, or between the data center or the cloud and, you know, an hospital or hotel facility, or even the house. Right. And, what we see is that there is an imperative for us to actually provide visibility across the underlay and the overlay so that we, we have this end-to-end -end visibility from layer two all the way to layer seven. Um, and so that's one of the things that truly differentiate us is to be able to provide you visibility from underlay, layer two, layer three, all the way to really the end user experience. Yeah, so other than a broken wire, well you'll see that from the layer two, but broken or kinked wires, I remember that in my yep. old, old school networking days. Which, which product set are we talking about now? So, just, so we're talking just, about two products, okay. DxNetOps and AppNeta. Okay. Uh, they form the foundation of this solution. Um, and you know, speaking about the types of issues, they, they are, and talking about private AI, it's quite interesting to see how these modern workloads are going to be very, very sensitive to things like packet loss and jitter and scheduling and microbursts, yeah. which are happening on the network. You know, I've seen the instances where just a 5% packet loss at an ingress of a hyperscaler would result in an application to completely fall down, right? And it's very difficult to troubleshoot these kind of issues if you don't have a right of technology. Yeah, how, how far, into the cloud does the, does this go and help help them? Oh, you can, we can install, so in, in some of uh, our cloud partners, uh, we can install kind of a virtual probe in some of, so I'm not going to announce it today yeah. because it's not completely <laughs> done done, yeah. but we currently are working with three of uh, the hyperscalers to have our technology natively baked into their data centers. Um, that makes sense. I, I think again, even even with Hawk saying everybody's repatriating and the numbers he's putting up there, I think moving. But I still think that pieces of it, like if you're having a website hosted or something like that, there's still going to be multi-tier applications all the way back to the mainframe. And to your point, when you start to look at these, and I was talking to one of the customers earlier today, who was talking about latency and yep. being able to make sure, and they they're a financial services company and a lot of the uh, different transactions they deal with are actually still done on the mainframe, which surprisingly enough, that's not going away either. And I know, yes. I know Broadcom has a big business there as well, so <laughs> that's a whole, whole, whole different topic. But where do, where do you see uh, customers getting started with, with your products at? Because it is kind of different in those three different, three different yeah. things. It's, it's got to be different places with the different sets. Yeah, we, we would definitely have three different buyers uh, for, for the three solution sets. I think the only thing that is really in common is that typically we're, we're engaging at a certain level in the organization with uh, specific um, teams uh, within the infrastructure team, IT teams for network and automation, for value stream management. Typically what we see in more and more you know, chief transformation officers are being embarked by many large enterprises. So we have three different buyers, which are very kind of different. Um, so where do we start? Well, if you look at value stream management, the, the trigger is a lot of organizations trying to rethink um, their operating model, trying to adopt value stream management as a, as a way to accelerate their time to market. They understand that the, the, the build and deliver with the kinds of technologies that VMware is, is, is providing or hyperscalers are providing is no longer where the challenges are. The challenges are, tend to be up, up, upstream yeah. in the funding, in the approval processes, in the compliance. All that stuff is, is, is really where the challenges are. So typically chief transmission officer, typically we start with value stream mapping, we try to understand what is the as is, what is, what is that end-to-end -end kind of lead time that exists there. You look at the automation, 
oftentimes the, the trigger is that these organizations are trying to move workloads around. That forces them to rethink the existing schedules. Um, they are introducing some Gen AI capabilities, some data analytics capabilities. Suddenly that triggers them to rethink their existing job and workloads. And as, as they do that, they are, they are basically looking more strategically at what is the solution for the next five to 10 years. And finally, around NetOps, more often than not, what we see is VCF deployment, software defined network, SDDC, or more commonly, uh, customers have deployed SD1, you know, in verticals such as healthcare or retail, and suddenly they are two, three years later, and they realize that they have some serious issues in terms of observability. No, I, I think that all makes sense. I really appreciate you coming on board and helping break it down because, again, I, for me, it's it's a new world. <laughs> oh. I've been I've been coming to here, so you know, it's it's really great to have you on board and uh, you know helping us understand how it all fits together. Because I, I think, again, it's super interesting. And now that you're all one company and you know bringing these solutions to head, so thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah. And thank you for watching this episode of theCUBE here at VMware Explore 2024. We'll be right back with more, so don't go away.